there's a lot happening in the scriptures today, uh, really rich readings, and I'm going to spill the beans, but I have to connect it to next week's uh, scripture also. And uh, as usual, the gospel just continues. So the last verse today, we go to the next verse and continuing next week. So here, Jesus has just said to Peter, Simon, uh, uh, you're no longer Simon, you're Peter, rock. I'll build my church on you because what you just said, if this didn't come from mere man or from flesh. This, this came from God our Father. He has revealed this to you. And so he gives the ultimate compliment to Peter and then even his intentions of using Peter as a, as a vital part of the forming of the church and the foundation of the church. And in the very next verse, he's going to uh, tell Peter something else. As Peter says, as he says to Peter, now I'm going to let you guys know I'm going to have to die. I'm going to be put to death. And Peter says, no, no, that can never happen to you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Those are the strongest words I think Jesus says in all of the gospel. The only thing close to it is when he tells the Pharisees that they were like uh, tombs, beautiful on the outside, beautiful marble, but inside like dead men's bones. But this is striking to turn to Peter after this ultimate compliment that he's the very founder of the church. Now he says, get behind me, Satan. You're trying to trip me up. But there's also some wonderful things happening. Now, first of all, uh, all three of the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell this story. But only in Matthew do, do these kind of words happen. In the other gospels, uh, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And I am is a loaded uh, phrase. I am is the the name or the whatever, the expression God used in the burning bush to say who he was, I am, I am. So there's kind of a revelation of him as a messianic person when he says that. But here it's more explicit. Only in the Gospel of Matthew does he say, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? So he kind of proclaims his messianic uh, nature. And then Peter responds, you are the Christ. And he's very explicit. Christ is Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then from that, he responds. But listen to the parallelism here. This is very strong. In the first reading, God's very present in all of these scriptures today. In the first reading um, from, from Isaiah, Isaiah is speaking the word of the Lord, and he says to Shebna, who is the master of the palace, I will thrust you out of your office. Get out and pull you down from your station. And then he's going to hand over that authority that Shebna had to Eliakim. On that day I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of I will clothe your robe, gird him with your sash, give him your authority. He shall be like a father over the inhabitants of Israel. I will place the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And then in the gospel... He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So to both Eliakim and to Peter, he's establishing them in this authority. And then in the gospel, the beauty is what follows because in describing what we say is the experience of confession, that uh, whatever you bind will be bound and whatever you loose will be loosed, um, this is experience that God, through Jesus, is giving to the church through Peter and the generations to follow, this power, this power of forgiveness. And it's not a surprise to me that it would focus on forgiveness or love, but... Um, I had an insight today, and I'll share with you in a moment, because I think the insight is, uh, is the key to the Scriptures today. You know, Jesus starts by asking this question, who do people say that I am? It's the most general question on earth. What are the people saying about you? What do people say about you? And so the, the apostles start like a litany. Well, some say you're... Uh, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, Elijah, you know, they're saying this and that and this and that. 
And then Jesus turns on them and says, who do you say that I am? Very directly. And Peter gives his response. I would say it sounds like Peter had an insight. Something new hit him. And in this awareness, he announces, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And Jesus responds with a further insight. And on you, I will build my church. You know, insight is, is a, a different kind of awareness. People can know a lot of it. I could ask you a whole bunch of things about our faith. And I'm sure I could get answer after answer about it, you know. Uh, if I asked you, how are you supposed to go to confession the old way or the way that we all learned as kids, you'd, you'd probably someone or many would say, well, you start, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been this long since my last confession. These are my sins. I've done my penance and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But just knowing those facts doesn't mean you have a real insight. I know that when I was first ordained, Within the first year, we changed the sack of reconciliation significantly. There were a lot of details that changed, and um, I'm not sure that people got it, but I did, because my role was different than when I first started as a priest. For one thing, if you all remember, if you were born before the council, we used to go into a dark room, for the most part, most churches, and, uh, but when you opened the door, there was a light on because there was a kneeler there. And when you kneeled on that kneeler, the light went out, this little light. So you started with a tiny light and ended up kneeling in total darkness. And the rooms are kind of soundproofed, but not perfectly. So you'd hear, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I tried to listen to other people's sins, but I never could hear them. Uh, it just was the way it was. And then you'd hear the door close on the other side, and this door open, and the priest would, uh, as soon as that opened, you were supposed to start. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, blah, 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 blah. Correct? All right. The change was this. The priest started, good morning. How are you? Let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The priest started with all the talk. And you didn't start by saying, bless me, O Father, for I have sinned. Now, that is not just a change of words. It was that. But there's an awareness that I got. Instead of starting, like, in negativity and penance, and I'm a sinner, and these are my sins, there was a greeting and a beginning in prayer. That is hugely significant. We started in prayer rather than naming myself as a sinner. And all that was to follow uh, it was a much more positive experience of letting God in right now to bring healing and to bring peace. And this fits so much more with those words of Jesus to Peter. That mercy and love, forgiveness were to be shared. Well, I had decided at the last Mass, and I did my quick math as I was sitting this morning, I'm going to say that easily I say 10 Masses a week. It's probably closer to 15, 18, or 20 if you count the funerals and the weddings and the number of Masses on Sunday. Um, I rounded it down 10. And so if I said 10 a week at 52 weeks, 5,200 a year, okay? Times 12, um, it's over 60,000 Masses I have celebrated here since I've been here with you, Okay? Over 60,000. And for the majority of those, I'm going to say 90%, I use the second Eucharistic prayer. It's my favorite. It's simple. It's short. It's direct. It's the oldest. But this time, I've said this, say, 50,000 times since I've been here and not all the years before in my other churches. I've always loved the second Eucharistic prayer. And at the, at the words of consecration, I say, at the time he was betrayed, and I, I say that all the time, at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion. But it just hit me at the last Mass as I said it, and this is what I call an awareness. I knew the words. If you asked me, I would have said them. But the focus on betrayal, that that would be remembered, not at the night before he died, but 
at the time of his betrayal. And the reason I think that's so significant is that we hear him choosing Peter, founding the church on Peter. In the next few verses that we'll hear next Sunday, he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter betrays him, and Jesus welcomes him back. Of course, it's mixing all the scriptures together because they're not all the same. And then in John's gospel, he'll say to Peter, who betrayed him three times, I don't even know the man. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, or you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And so there's this beautiful richness that as we consecrate the bread and wine, that as we celebrate Christ as our food, nourishment, we're reminded that in that story, from his closest friends, his chosen apostles, there's betrayal. And yet that doesn't stop his love or his use of Peter, his use of you and me to build his church and his kingdom and share the gift of his life. And maybe it's because it roots itself so beautifully in the words of the psalm that we kept repeating and singing. Your love, Lord, is, is eternal. It's eternal. And I would hope that we would see this as true insight, that love isn't something we earn from God. It's not something we get because of what we do, because of our faithfulness. That might cause us to appreciate it more, but it doesn't stop God or make God love. God's love is eternal. And if we come to an awareness, an insight that that is so, that is really true, not just as a general truth, but I know it for me, Lord. Your love is eternal. I know that. What I don't do, you love me. I can't stop you from loving me. I could even hate you, God, and you won't stop loving me because your love's eternal. You are love. Now, that's insight. That's awareness. Of course, every time we come to the Scriptures, and in a very beautiful and formal way when we come at Mass, we have them proclaimed to us, usually an Old Testament, a song response in the psalm, a New Testament, and then, of course, the, the core of the Scriptures for us as, as Christians and Catholics, the Gospel. Every time we come and hear this Word of God, it takes us back in time. We go back basically about 2,000 years, and sometimes in the Old Testament, 3,500 years. But we're looking backward in time at these events that took place, or at least are described as having taken place. Okay. But that's not the point of these scriptures. I am pretty sure that they were written for us and for the people in 1,000 years if the earth is still here. Written for us as we connect with the past to find something, a, a deeper awareness right now in the present. And what if, what if we had in general a, a thought, a, a belief, we'd even tell people, oh, yeah, yes, I know God is eternal. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's not the same as believing it in such a personal way that we claim it. That's my truth. I know that's so. And once that happens, our faith can never be the same, ever. It just won't. Because we will walk with a peace, we will walk with a joy, with a, a conviction, with an awareness, even little betrayals or big ones, even our little turning away or big turning away, our God just still keeps loving us. And once we believe that, I think the road home is always filled with peace. The road home is always filled with peace. You know, I hear confessions, and a lot of priests will tell you it's not their favorite thing to hear confessions. Here, I remember uh, one of the priests in the seminary telling our class, I'll never forget it, he became a bishop later, but he said, um, <laughs> he said, hearing confessions of nuns is like being pelted to death by popcorn. And he he went on further to say, you know, you hear this stuff. 
Father, I sinned in my speech, as I said, an unkind word to sister so-and-so. And, the, and he would be like, ah, oh, you come in, please? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I suppose it's a sin, but that's hardly a turning away. That, that's, you know. And I don't know that when you come up with those little tiny thing ets, these little thing ets that, that we're really entering into God's mercy in a way that's meaningful. But what about if we, for example, became aware of betraying or hating or refusing to forgive or even wishing someone dead? Any number of things that are profoundly awful. And when I look in this world that, you know, almost every day it seems there is a mass killing or an attempted mass killing somewhere just yesterday again. Uh, it, it's, it's every day. It's almost sad to be connected to the whole nation, let alone the whole world, when we just hear day after day. And I try to imagine what would it be like, what it would it be like to have in my hand a gun and pull a trigger as I shoot a person, what? How does one do that? And if one did do that, how does one deal with that they did that? And if they did deal with that they did that, what would happen when they came to the awareness? I need God's mercy. I need forgiveness. I need to forgive myself. And in that early church, at least in the words that we hear in the scriptures, it was important to Jesus to say in the locking and unlocking doors, taking the keys of this kingdom and this church, that one of the most fundamental things would be the bestowal of mercy, the experience of forgiveness. Because I think without that, sometimes it might be considered almost impossible to go on to move on, especially when we sin in very deep and profound ways. So today, there's a lot of awareness that is shared with us, starting with Peter. And um, for whatever reason Peter said this, if he said it, he came to some awareness that was profound. You're the Christ. You're the Christ. And yet after that, just moments later, he betrayed him. And, and tries to stop what his work is. He, he, he gives him the name, the Christ, but then doesn't recognize that the Christ will reveal what the Christ must do. And in so doing, Jesus turns on him and slaps him hard. Get behind me, Satan. And yet, the love that Jesus had for Peter was certainly clear, and it was forever. Hopefully you and I come to that same awareness. Hopefully this word opens us up to us deeply. And that we walk away, if we didn't already believe it, hopefully, even if one more person here believes it today, God, your love is eternal. It's eternal. It's mine.